to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior. Christ Church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus himself, the friend of sinners. Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to Christ Church. It's Pastor Ryan here. I'm the vicar of Christ Church Oceanside, um, and it's my joy to welcome you to church today. For all of those who are part of Christ Church, we miss you. If we haven't been able to see you in person yet, I want to give a few kind of announcements uh, right off the the bat today, just to kind of inform you of a few things. We are reassessing just about everything about how we're doing church online. Um, And so we're just trying to readjust and revision um, to understand the needs of the next year, because it seems to us that there will be an ongoing need for those within our parish to receive church online. There's still going to be hesitations. There's still going to be illness. There still will be limitations from our government. So we're going to be balancing a lot of things here in the next few months. So please be patient with us. I know we are kind of hoping by this point in September that we'd have our full-fledged liturgy up on Sundays. And so we're still working on that. We have a lot of uh, exciting things coming. We have new people who are getting involved in doing church online and things like that. So there will be some stuff coming out in the next few weeks, some more clarity and a more robust service online. So the full Anglican liturgy, preaching, readings, response, everything. So please just be patient with us as we figure that all out, okay? And the other thing is this, is that meeting in person is actually going really well. We're really encouraged by it. We're very excited. It feels fantastic to be in a room together singing. I think the, um, even I noticed this past Sunday, just the joy, the difference, the anointing even that's present in preaching when we're gathered together. The um, the transcendence at meeting at the Lord's table and sharing and partaking together. Um, so I understand if you can't be there for safety's sake and things like that, but please know it is safe and it is really um, beneficial and enjoyable. Now I wanted to pray uh, a prayer this morning. Um, As you know, we have our field guides for daily prayer. It's kind of like a condensed book of common prayer to the really just essentials that you can keep in your pocket. Mine's getting pretty well worn, but I think it adds character to it. Um, But I want to read uh, the prayer for the local church today and just know that my heart is very much with you. Almighty and ever-living God, Ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this church family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the brokenhearted. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Jesus, I ask that as we worship together today, as we open the scriptures, that your presence would be with each one in their home, that you would enliven our hearts with faith to engage deeply and intentionally with your presence and with the revelation of your scriptures. Let us not fall back into a lukewarm heart because of the limitations of this pandemic, but instead enliven them, fire us up within with passion for Christ and a hunger for your presence, we pray. Amen. i 
Our Gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in chapter 4, verses 18 through to the end of 20. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to thee, Lord Christ. I want to begin with this question this morning. What is the best way to live? And I don't mean what's the best way to success. I mean, what's the best way to a life marked by goodness? What is the good way of living? According to our created nature, like a good way should feel natural, right, to feel as though it makes you more yourself, not less, that it produces true fulfillment and happiness, and that it's not only a benefit to you, but it's a benefit to others and to the world. That's a good way that's worth passing on to your kids and to your grandchildren. What's your message in life and your purpose? What defines and orients your conscience? What you know to be right and true and good and worth pursuing? A good way helps you prioritize every other area of your life. It helps you have a sense of like, what am I about? It's very different from a survivalistic way of living. It's very different than a selfish way of living. It's about living with clarity and purpose, seeking to do and be of goodness. Something that benefits the whole world around you. Now, a lot of us don't have a really clear answer to that question. You know, what is your, <laughs> what is your way, let alone what is the good way? Because of that, what we end up doing is trying to find teachers, which I think is a healthy response. We're looking for a rabbi, somebody who will teach us and train us and mentor us and show us the way. Uh, the big message of our world right now is that you get to find your own way and you get to choose your own way and you get to craft your own way. That sounds great, but it's actually quite destructive. It puts way too much cosmic pressure on the individual and you can feel the stress and the strain. What might feel like freedom in theory is soul crushing in actuality. So what we end up finding ourselves doing is just looking for help, looking for a teacher, looking for someone to give us some stinking answers because we can't compute all of the variables all the time. So it leads to this question, who is your rabbi? Who is your teacher? And where are you going to go to find wisdom and the understanding that you long for? This kind of innate need to find a rabbi actually is a big part of what's driving our media usage. Yes, we're looking for escapes from what we're feeling. We're looking for entertainment. You know, we're looking to be wowed. <laughs> but the reality is there's deeper longings and drives there. We want good and new information. And so when we are scrolling through social media, that's what we're looking for, something wow me, something impact me, something help me. And so then when we're, when we're watching news outlets and we're watching cable news television, things like that, we're reading the newspaper, we're constantly trying to make sense of the world around us by taking in new information. 
YouTube videos, and film. We're looking for inspiration. I want something to inspire me out of the humdrum of my everyday life into something more beautiful and transcend transcendent and meaningful. But this quest for a rabbi, for knowledge, sometimes we can take in information without actually asking, who is, what's the source of this wisdom? Is this source trustworthy? What are the motivations behind those who are outputting this content? And really, what is the main message that's being communicated? And if I was to follow and embrace this message, what's the movement or the community that I'm going to be a part of? Where's this going? Where's this headed? What's this going to do in the world? And who is this making me into? These are important questions for our time. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news here, but... It seems as though things are going to get darker still before they get better. More and more and more, we're seeing, yes, the polarization. We're seeing lots of fighting. We're seeing lots of people really, really frustrated. And we're seeing all kinds of information being poured out. Just flipping through my social media the last few days, the amount of intensity, as well as misinformation that's coming my way, I'm finding myself mentally just going, how do I compute all of this info? How do I combat what I think is unhealthy or wrong? And what is the good way that I want to hold on to? That's a lot of mental work. And that's why we have so much brain fog, is we're actually turning to social media for entertainment, finding ourselves confronted with really big issues and then trying to figure out subconsciously where we fit in the story and how we're going to act. We're losing sight of the good way, mostly just by being overwhelmed. And so I think what becomes increasingly important for us in these days ahead is to know who our teacher is to know the way that we're following and to give our best and fullest energies to living out that way, the good way. Now, as we study the Gospel of Matthew here, I want to do a couple things today. First, I want to catch people up. If you missed this two year long series to just kind of catch you up because we're actually starting next week going to be in Matthew chapter five. And we're going to start again by looking at the section about Jesus fulfilling the law. And in that section, we're going to hear all about Jesus' teaching about what he thinks is moral goodness. We're going to see Jesus' vision for human life. We're going to see his priorities. We're going to see his expectations. But we're also going to see, above all else, what Jesus provides to make that way of living possible. So that's why I've titled this series, The Good Way. Is we're going to look at Jesus's good way for how he, how we as humans are meant to live. And that's going to give us a sense of moral compass. That's going to give us our sense of ethics. And that's going to give us our sense of values of what we are pursuing and what matters to Jesus. But before we get to that teaching, the question I want to answer today is this. Why follow Jesus? So here he's going to be very explicit. And he's going to tell us, this is the way you should live. This is what you should do. This is what your marriage should look like. This is how you should handle your finances. And Jesus is going to teach that as a gift to us to go, look, I know there's a whole lot of ways out there. But this, this is the good way, the best way for you. But before we can look at that, we really have to answer this question. Why is Jesus the best way to follow? Why is he good enough for me to trust? And so what I want to do today is I want to look through the Gospel of Matthew, because what we saw in the text that we just read is we have these brothers. We have Simon, who's called Peter. We have Andrew, and we have James, and we have John. And these 
brothers have their own businesses and they're running these businesses and they're family businesses. So they probably go back generations, right? They're working with their dads and they meet Jesus and Jesus has such an impact upon them. Jesus is so obviously good and obviously worthy of trusting that they leave their businesses and they leave their life in order to just follow Jesus. This is the level of intentionality that I think is needed of Christians in this season. We need to turn off social media. We need to turn off the news. We need to far lessen by 90% the intake that we bring in through um, these uh, means of information. We need to quiet that voice and we need to exalt the voice of Jesus. And not, we're not saying everybody has to do that, but we are saying as followers of Jesus, we need to do that. That's what we're meant to do in this season. So let's just do a brief walk through today of Matthew's gospel. And I want you to see why Jesus is worth our devotion, our confidence, and our focus. And why, if you are new to this, why you would consider making Jesus the one that you follow. That you would accept Jesus as your rabbi, as your teacher. And what it would look like for you to become his apprentice. Now, the beginning of Matthew's gospel starts with a genealogy. And the point in chapter one of this genealogy is to show where Jesus comes from. And he does so by showing that Jesus is the descendant of Abraham, that Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne of David over Israel, and that Jesus is actually the promised Messiah and Savior. And he does that through showing Jesus's family line. And part of why this is important is this, is that Jesus is shown through the genealogy of Matthew to be at the center of history's great story. That the great story of human history and of the creation and the universe itself, Jesus is actually at its center. Now, that might feel like a rival to you. Our culture today says, you know, intrinsically to us, we're the center of the universe. Our happiness is paramount and we want other people to exist for the purpose of making us happy. And this is kind of always sewn in that we actually think of ourselves as the main character of the story of the world. But the reality is we're not. We're here for a very small amount of time will be forgotten within three generations, very likely. You know, if you were to ask me today, Ryan, what's your great-grandmother's middle name? I can't tell you. I actually don't know my great-grandmother's story. I would love to, but I don't. And this is the reality of the human life. So our, the way that we find fulfillment, this desire to be at the center of history's story is not actually fulfilled by being the main character. It's fulfilled for us by being with the main character, and that is Jesus. So when Matthew starts there, the whole genealogy is showing Jesus is the one that was promised to Abraham. Jesus is the one that was promised to David. Jesus is the one that was promised to the world to be their savior. And all of human history, which is why we have the scriptures, is showing, get ready for the Messiah. And when Jesus comes, we see that Jesus is that. So Jesus is the main story of history. But then we also see in the genealogy some shady characters. In the sense that we see in Jesus's genealogy, it's not all clean. There's actually big messes in this genealogy. There's prostitution and there's rape and there's abuse and there's all sorts of moral character failings in this genealogy. And Matthew takes care to highlight those issues. 
because Jesus is not only the great big story, Jesus is also entering into the broken story of humanity. Because in Jesus' messy backstory is your messy backstory, is my messy backstory. So we simultaneously have the center of the universe, but also willing to enter into the brokenness of real humanity. In chapter 2, we see the birth of Jesus. And this is where we see that Jesus is not just a historical figure. He's not just human. Jesus' true and ultimate origins are in God, that Jesus is divine, and Jesus is God. So he's fully human and fully God and fully coming to save the world. And so again, we have Matthew drawing out this um, you know, contrast. Jesus is God, but then in the same, in, in the following paragraph, same chapter, we see that Jesus becomes a political refugee, fleeing his home country to take up residence in Egypt from an abusive power structure in Israel and King Herod. So here we have God and the lowly refugee with no home, no place, fleeing for his life. In chapter 3, we're introduced to somebody named John the Baptizer. This is actually the cousin of Jesus. And he's been anointed to proclaim the coming of the Messiah and to prepare the way. And so he stokes a revival in the wilderness. And it's important that it's in the wilderness because it's drawing people out of their everyday, normal, commercial life drawing them out and saying, another way is coming. This way sucks, the way that we've been living. Political powers and economic systems and survivalism and religious systems, this is soul crushing. And so people are so hungry for a new way, they're going out into the wilderness, treks for a day or two to get out there to hear this voice crying in the wind, going, another way is coming, prepare the way. And so the message is, repent to the way that you've been living, be baptized and cleansed in order to receive the new way. Now, the religious leaders, they come out, hear this message, refuse to, to repent and refuse to be baptized because really what they're saying is, we haven't done anything wrong. We're doing everything right. And so in all of this, then comes Jesus. First kind of public moments. And Jesus loves the humility of John's message. To go repent of this life and this way of self-provision. Repent of that and receive the kingdom of heaven. The, right, the way we are meant to live with God. Jesus loves humility and desires to be baptized in solidarity with all of these sinners. Now, John tries to prevent Jesus because he knows he's the only one who actually is righteous. Jesus doesn't need to repent and Jesus doesn't need to be baptized for himself. But Jesus insists, saying, I must fulfill all righteousness. I must fulfill all goodness. And so here we see the character of Jesus. Not only is he this great promised savior, but he has a, a sad, broken, painful family line. And not only is Jesus um, God, but he also knows what it's like to be persecuted and attacked and threatened by evil powers. And not only is Jesus perfect personally, but he's willing and wants to have solidarity with sinners who need to be saved. And so Jesus insists on being baptized. This is what we see because he wants to be in the good that's happening in the world, no matter how small and seemingly insignificant. Jesus is a lover of goodness and doesn't care how people perceive him. He wants to be a part of that goodness. Now, in this choice to be baptized, the goodness of Jesus reveals the goodness of God because God shows up to attest to the identity and the goodness of Jesus. 
And so what we have is God the Father being revealed, speaking from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So think of Jesus' story so far. All sorts of hardship and challenges, and born to these lowly parents, but God takes pleasure in Jesus. And God takes pleasure in what Jesus loves and how he has lived in obscurity up until this point. And the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus. So the Holy Spirit, who has been reserved for only God's purposes, is now seen to be poured out without measure upon God's means of salvation in Jesus himself. Chapter 4, we see Jesus then, from this place, go into the wilderness and faces off against evil. And not in the triumphant way we want to think, you know, some battle against Sauron in Mordor. It's actually this humble, deep internal battle where Jesus in a state of weakness and thirst and hunger and without uh, a home to, to, you know, dwell in for 40 days, wanders the wilderness and faces the intensity of temptation from the devil. The evil at work within the world that we see, the rotten fruit out there, Jesus faces it at its deepest, most intrinsic level in his own heart. And so we see him resist the temptation to self-provision. We see him resist the temptation to self-preservation. We see him resist the temptation to self-promotion. And this is where we really start to see the goodness of Jesus in solidarity with the poor and the broken and the sad stories. Now we see Jesus able to resist what no other human has been able to resist, which is evil. Jesus in his heart of hearts knows how to win over evil. And these temptations are important because these are the temptations that ruin our lives. And for men like me who have, you know, a spouse and kids and a job, I am always seen on a consistent basis where what's inside of me is creating the biggest messes in my life. I'm actually the one screwing this up. I'm the one bringing evil into the, into my own home. And, it, and, and this is not to pick on me. This is just a brutal honesty to go. The evil at work in my life I see most coming from inside of me. So why Jesus is so compelling as my rabbi, as my teacher, as the one that I want to apprentice under is because we see Jesus face evil at the level we face evil. But we see Jesus have the strength of goodness to resist that evil. That's what I need most. I need somebody who can show me how to live free of evil and devote my energies towards goodness. And so it, it reveals the fact that I'm going to need a savior. Now, one thing I didn't mention now that I think of it is in his baptism. What Jesus does is foreshadows the fact that he's not only going to have solidarity with sinners. He's actually going to die on behalf of sinners. So the going into the water is foreshadowing of his coming crucifixion and death, where he will actually pay for the sins of those he's in solidarity with. And when he comes up from the water, it's a picture of the resurrection. That Jesus is triumphant over all evil and even death. And so those who believe in Jesus have salvation. So they're understood in the brokenness of their story in life and their sins. They're saved from those sins in his death. And they're raised up to a new life in his resurrection. And so this is what makes Jesus so stinking compelling is to go, I don't just need somebody to give me good advice. I need somebody to get me, understand me at my deepest levels. But I need somebody who can actually intervene and save my life. I'm dying here. I need a savior. And then to train me in his ways that I'd be like him. 
This is the power of Jesus as rabbi. It's that he's not just a good teacher. He's actually doing miraculous things to those who follow him. He's changing us from the inside out. And so we'll see this next here. So in the middle of chapter four, Jesus begins his public ministry. And he begins actually by picking up John the Baptist's message and continuing it. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance is central to Jesus' message. He's not just going, hey, I'm a good guy. I'll be your homie. Add me to whatever you're doing. Jesus is clear that what you're doing is killing you. Turn from that. Run from that garbage. Because you can tell it's not fulfilling you. It's not good for others. As your kids grow up, you can see they're doing stupid stuff that you don't want them to do, but you realize you've done it too. Your seat, turn from that life and follow the good way. Leave the bad way in order to have the good way for, for it's at hand. And so the, the communication then is turn from that sinful way. For you can have what I'm offering you in the good way. And so this is what's so compelling to Simon Peter and to James and John and to Andrew is that they're seeing in Jesus, his message matches his character. And his character is triumphant over evil. And he's offering to me a way out of what I'm stuck in. And so then we see people drop their jobs in order to make Jesus their number one priority. Now, do we have to do that today? Not necessarily. But we do have to give Jesus that kind of priority. We do have to say, he's my main pursuit. And so at this place, then what we see is great crowds of people follow after Jesus. They hear the good news of the kingdom and that obviously is attractive to them because it's happy news. God's kingdom and way is here and is available to down and out sinners like you and me. But then Jesus goes on to showcase the power of his way, healing every disease and every affliction. Everyone who comes to Jesus with a need, he meets those needs. And so he's about to show them this is what's available in the kingdom. But then if you start to think Jesus is just some drive through, you can pull up and get your miracles. Then Jesus heads away. He leaves the crowds. And so they have to follow him. And he takes them to a place, a, a hill. And he sits upon the hill and he just waits. And everyone has to just sit quietly because in the New Testament times, the teacher would actually sit and not stand. And everyone would have to take a restful position around him. So then Jesus brings it down to go, now it's time to teach. Let me tell you how to come into this life of the kingdom, this good way. It's not just a a miracle dispensary. It's actually a deeper way of life. And so then we see Jesus start to teach and he begins with something called the Beatitudes. And the main message of the Beatitudes that we see here, number one, is that man, is it ever inviting to broken, hurting, messed up folk who just go, my life is in ruins. The Beatitudes of Jesus really are attractive to those who are down and out. It brings us in in a way that feels like, oh man, this is made just for me. So I want you to listen to it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. So blessed are those who are bankrupt internally, morally. Blessed are those who mourn, who have great reason for grief, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for something good in this life. They shall be satisfied. So you can see it, it, it communicates that this way, the way of Jesus, is for the down and out and for the broken. It's not for those who think they've made it who are successful in their own eyes. It's for those who see the need for a new way. 
And so he begins by saying what needs to change is the inner life. The inner life needs to be honest about where it's at and receive from me what it really needs. The mess inside needs a solution. And so, and then leads to a path that looks like transcendent fulfillment, that you have everything that you could need or want in Jesus, even so much so that you can handle the world still being broken, where you are so at peace that you can be merciful, that you are so fulfilled in Christ that you have a pure heart that you, you see God even in the horrors that are going on around us. We still see that God is here, God is active, and God is bringing about a redemptive future. Blessed are the peacemaker, peacemakers, for they shall be called sons, children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kind of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. Here Jesus shows that you can have a fulfillment that is not context dependent, that is not circumstantial. The next thing he goes on to teach about is being salt and light. It's really a challenge against the religious system of that time. If your way doesn't actually help people, what good is it? And so religious systems that just heap on more responsibilities onto your soul, more shame, more guilt, more destruction, what good is it? And Jesus says, if it doesn't help, if it doesn't preserve, if it doesn't illuminate, if it doesn't bring life, then it just should be thrown out and trampled under your feet because it's worthless. And so the way of Jesus is challenging all of the ways of the world and religious systems, but is offering a good way of inner fulfillment that actually helps, actually preserves your life actually illuminates the dark places and does something good in you and is good for others. Nobody else in history offers this level of help. Jesus is the promised Messiah. Jesus is the promised blessing to the nations through Abraham. Jesus is the promised king through David. Jesus is the promised savior. Jesus is the one that enters into your messy life story. Jesus is the one who is God come in flesh. Jesus is the one who knows what it's like to be a political refugee. Jesus is the one who will make himself lowly in order to lift up humanity into salvation. Jesus is the one who will die for your sins because he loves you. Jesus is the one who will raise you from the dead by his own power of resurrection. Jesus is the one that will do the inner, internal work of salvation to renovate your heart. Jesus is the one who will make your life good for others. A blessing to the world around you. Take a minute right now. If you have a spouse, look at your spouse. Think about your spouse. Are you good for them? In your day-to-day life, are you a blessing to them? Think about your kids and your grandkids. Are you good for them? And I don't just mean bare minimum, put a roof over their head and food on the table. I mean, are you good for their hearts? Do you love them well? Do you care for them, protect them? Your neighbors, would they miss you if you were gone? You, those you work with, do they find a breath of fresh air when you show up? The answer to all these questions for me is no. I'm not, not, I'm not living the way I know I'm meant to live. But here's the good news. You don't have to 
Make that happen of your own strength and will. This is the work that Jesus promises to do in you and for you and then through you so that the answer to those questions would be yes. Jesus loves my wife through me. Jesus loves my kids through me. Jesus loves my neighbors through me. And I'm so ecstatic to be a part of the ride. Jesus loves my work through me. Jesus blesses, has turned my life into a blessing for others. I'm like a tree planted beside streams of water, bearing good fruit in and out of season. Who are you following? Who's your rabbi? And do they have the ability to be the center of history, but care enough to enter into your story, to save you from the inner reality of sin and lead you into a life of innate goodness? And for those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus, are we giving the voice of Jesus priority in our day-to-day -day life? And so as we pick up our studies again here of the Gospel of Matthew, that would be my hope. Raise the voice of Jesus. Soak in the scriptures. Read it day in and day out. Love it. Gnaw on the bones of it. Find true nutrition in it so that we would have clarity of mind of what the good way is. And when we know the good way, we will know how to discern all other decisions in this life. All other problems will be able to sniff out and tell where the good way is through it. So my friends, I invite you to pick up the Gospel of Matthew and study it with me with all your heart in the weeks to come. Savior
Well, thank you, my friends, for being here with us today um, here for Christ Church Online. It's such a joy when you come with us. Um, I want to encourage a few things today before we close um, and just make you aware of a few others. The first thing is that um, my friend Duncan Polson from Victoria is going to start working with us here on our online services. We're going to be seeking to really cultivate on the island the opportunity to join into following above all else the way of Jesus with us. And to do so through Anglican traditions. And so we'll be having a full liturgy here um, online, minus, of course, the Eucharist, which we'll only do in person. But we want to encourage you to continue to um, stir up love and affection for one another. Reach out, call, email, text, you know, meet for park coffees, go for walks. Be careful. But don't let fear in this time keep you in isolation or separate you from the community of Christ. Now, of course, we are meeting in person on Sundays at the news place, and we'd love for you to join us there. It's safe, and honestly, it just feels so good. So we'd love to have you join us there every Sunday at 10. Let me close now with the blessing. May the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.